Hello and welcome to the Naira Bet sponsored Daily Racing Form webinar on the 2017 Kentucky Derby. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornital, back with you. Very excited uh, that Naira Bets is sponsoring this evening and very excited to bring in two very special guests who I've had the pleasure of working with a handful of times over the years. And I'm sure we're going to get some great insights from them over the course of the next hour. We'll start off by introducing the panel. Our first guest is the best-selling handicapping author of all time. He's the maker of his eponymous speed figures and really a legend in the world of racing analysis. He is Andy Beyer. Andy, how are you doing tonight? I am well. Thanks for that great introduction. I, maybe I should just retire for the <laughs> evening right now. <laughs> Our second guest is another who really doesn't need much introduction. He's the national handicapper for the Daily Racing Forum. You know him from the fantastic Derby Watch feature he does throughout the winter with Jay Privman of Daily Racing Forum, as well as his weekend warrior segments on DRF.com. He is Mike Watchmaker. Mike, what's up? How you doing, Pete? Hi, Andy. Hi, I'm fine. Excellent, excellent. Well, we're going to start off today's show with a quick word from our sponsor, Naira Betts, and then we're going to get into talking about this year's Kentucky Derby. Uh, Naira Betts right now has a $200 sign-up bonus. You can get in on the action by opening a Naira Betts wagering account for a limited time. Join today and earn that $200 bonus. Getting the bonus is easy. Just use promo code TC. DRF 200 and bet 200 and you'll get 200 bet the Derby through the triple crown and beyond while betting anytime, anywhere nationwide, go to NairaBets.com, enter the promo code TC DRF 200 and qualify for Naira bets, exclusive bet 200, get 200 sign up promotion. All right, gentlemen. Uh, I'm really eager to hear your thoughts on this race. I'm at the point now where I've gone over it enough times. I've sort of talked myself into and out of various uh, handicapping opinions. Uh, I've got some some very strong leans. I'm hoping you guys can help me not only finalize my opinion, but also help me and everybody tuning into the webinar tonight, our standing room only webinar, I might add, maybe figure out a little bit of how they're going to bet this race. Let's start off by just going through the field in post-position order. Uh, no obligation to talk at any length about any of these if we don't have much to say, and we can pause and, and digress as much as we want. If that's the case, we'll start off with number one, looking at Lee. Mike Watchmaker, um, how big of a problem is the number one post in the Kentucky Derby generally, and what do you think it means for number one, looking at Lee? Uh, Pete, generally, it's the death sentence. Um, but for looking at Lee, uh, it's not as bad as it could have been for a horse that has uh, speed or positional speed. I mean, looking at Lee, is essentially a drop back uh, uh, downtown closer, and um, he's going to drop out of it early, and, and he won't get shuffled back that severely on the inside because he was going to be amongst the back runners anyway. So, uh you know, I, the odd thing about it is that looking at Lee showed improved positional speed when he was third in the Arkansas Derby in his most recent start, which I thought was his best performance yet. But uh, uh, he still had to improve off of that race. The one hole doesn't help him, but I don't think it hurts him as much as it would hurt uh, other, other horses with different running styles. Andy, will looking at Lee appear on any of your tickets on Kentucky Derby Day? No, I think we've discussed looking at Lee more than he deserves. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to number two in the race. This is a uh, an unusual item. You don't often see paper that looks quite like this coming into a race like the Kentucky Derby. Is there anything more to expand on uh, for you, Andy, on Thunder Snow? I'm particularly interested in what you thought of his performance in the UAE Derby from a speed. Well, we, we estimated, and I think it was a fairly good estimate, uh, his uh, UAE Derby figure is a 94, uh, which makes him, you know, uh, like a 25 to one shot in the in this race. Personally, I mean, I'm going to have to see one horse out of the UAE Derby, you know, run well in the Kentucky Derby, uh, you know, before I would, uh, would before I would consider one. It certainly seems like a reasonable opinion. Watch. What about you? What are you thinking about Thunder Snow coming into this? Well, I, I do understand the, the appeal of looking for a new face in this particular Kentucky Derby, but I don't think Thunder Snow's 
the right new face. Um, and I completely agree with Andy. Uh, you know, I want to see some horse come over here from uh, out of the UAE Derby and be competitive. We haven't seen one be competitive yet. Uh, the first one who uh, wins the Kentucky Derby out of the UAE Derby will beat me. Very logical. Number three is fast and accurate. Horse is going to be a deserving long shot. Mike, we'll keep it with you. Any chance he ends up anywhere for you? No, uh, he's a great candidate to run last. Uh, I, you know, I look. I give the, the connections credit for coughing up two hundred thousand dollars to supplement him to this race, but I don't know if they deserve credit or or should be examined by some mental health experts. <laughs> but I mean, it, it's 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 a situation where this horse is just totally overmatched. Anything to add to that, Andy? Uh, nothing at all. I mean, he doesn't really belong in the race. How about untrapped for you, Andy? This is a horse uh, Steve Asmussen has had so much success in so many facets of his training career. Hasn't uh, gotten uh, had gotten it going in the Kentucky Derby to this point. I think the number is something like over thirteen. Any shot untrapped gets uh, Steve Asmussen off the mark. I, you know, this horse is not on my radar screen. His figures have all been weak. I uh, uh, I, I, you know, I couldn't consider him. Mike, anything to uh, anything to add? Any positive view? No, he, he's just seriously distance challenged. Uh, you know, uh, a mile and eight was way beyond his scope last time, even despite a wide trip in the Arkansas Derby. A mile and a sixteenth was beyond his scope in the Rebel. I mean, he had every chance to win that race, and he couldn't stay a mile and a sixteenth. So how is he going to possibly stay a mile and a quarter? Yeah, not not one that I'm really looking at, even at the bottom of Supers, based on that. Uh, losing ground in the lane, going shorter, um, and now, of course, stretching out to the 10 furlongs. Number five, always dreaming, is an interesting item. There's been a lot of chatter about him this week. A lot's been talked about him in terms of speed figures and the low figure two back. But then, of course, he stamps himself as a serious horse with that run in the Florida Derby. Mike, are you buying into always dreaming? Well, I always dream he could win this race. I, you know, he might be a very nice horse. He is three for three going two turns. But that said, all three of his victories going two turns were achieved with the benefit of being close to very slow early paces. And yes, I believe the pace in the Florida Derby was slow. It completely held together. And I do think that even though there isn't a tremendous amount of breakaway speed in this Kentucky Derby, paces in the Kentucky Derby are rarely... Uh, 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 moderate or slow. They're usually quite strong, and I think Always Dreaming is going to have to work a lot harder early than he has any other uh, any other of his route races. He might be a very nice horse. I, I wouldn't fall off my chair if he won, uh, but I'm not picking him on top or second or third for that matter. Andy, is this a horse who's captured uh, your imagination at all as a possible Derby winner at this point with the big figure last time? No, I'm. I'm. I, this is a horse I'm. I'm against. Uh, uh, you know, first in in a race th this wide open, <clears throat> I don't want the the, the f favorite or second choice unless they've got great credentials. But the the, the things I have against always dreaming. Number one. Yeah, his Florida Derby, the five-length win, figure at 97, you know, looks good. But you would have to say, of all the horses who won major prep races uh, for the Derby, he had the softest trip. I mean, he was sitting second behind his own stable mate, uh, sitting in the two-path. The leader fades. He goes by. Uh, in, in a race where, uh, as Mike pointed out, the speed, you know the speed held on well, uh, so I'm not that impressed there. And you know, by 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 this point in the history of the Derby, I think we we have to you know uh, you know mark a horse with a, a bit of a demerit. You know, when Todd Pletcher is, is the trainer. Uh, you know, I mean, any other context, you you automatically, uh, uh, you know, upgrade a Pletcher horse. But he's one for 45 in the Derby. His lone win was Super Saber. Came in a year when he had five of the 20 starters and he had a horse who happened to get a perfect trip. I mean, most of his Derby entrants have not only lost, but run dismally. I, I mean, we, we we've seen... You know the the phenomenon in many other contexts where 
horse, where pledger horses really give their best efforts in Florida and don't reproduce them elsewhere. I, I just think this horse has a lot of strikes against him. And plus, you know, some of the clocker comments from Mike Welsh uh, in the racing forum that I always pay attention to are kind of negative that this horse is not relaxing. He's not kind of settling in in his works like as you would want for a mile and a quarter race. I think that sums up uh, the case against Always Dreaming pretty well. Let's move on to number six, State of Honor. A candidate to be in front at the half mile into the race. Uh, is he a candidate to do anything more than that, Andy? You know, I, I don't think so. I, I, I mean, he, uh, he he just looks distance challenged. I mean, he was loose on the lead twice at Tampa Bay and, you know, gave it up uh, against horses who were in this field. Uh, I, I I don't see him. Mike, anything to add on State of Honor? No, I, I mean, I, I, I've uh, stated this uh, to the point of uh, ad nauseum uh, in, in a derby box uh, context for a while now. I mean, this horse has now had six career starts going two turns, and he's lost ground in the final furlong in all six of those starts. Uh, if that isn't a sign of a horse who has problems going a distance, nothing is. And the fact that he held on for second in the Florida Derby, I think, was really the proof that the pace was extremely soft. Um, and uh, it, 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 it reflects negatively on the aforementioned Always Dreaming. Number seven, Gervin, has been the subject of some uh, tremendous reporting by our colleague Jay Privman this week. Uh, the business with the shoes, staying in the stall, uh, not making the track until today when Mike Welch, based on his comments on Twitter, seemed a little bit less than impressed with him. I'm at the point where I'm just willing to let this one beat me out of all four slots. Am I being over dramatic in that assessment, Mike? No, I think you're absolutely correct, Pete. I mean, you know, even if you put aside uh, the whole drama with his foot issues and you shouldn't because it's important. Uh, but even if you put all of that aside, I mean, his, his paper just isn't good enough to win this race. Um, you know, a lot of people were willing to, 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 to accept him as a horse on the come after he won the risen star. Um, he beat a, a soft field. He beat on trap to, you know, I've already labeled as completely being completely distance challenged. Um, but he beat on trapped in that race. He earned a 93 buyer figure at that day. And a lot of people were willing to label him a horse on the cup. So even if you bought into that, you had to be disappointed with this Louisiana Derby. I mean, he took a step back buyer figure wise. Uh, it, it just was not a pretty race. He beat a horse in fact who was coming off a maiden victory. Um, you know, I, I just, his paper alone isn't good enough to win this race. And then when you add the foot issues on top of it that have severely compromised his training right on top of this race, he, he's just a horse that I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. Andy, any comment on Gervin? No, Mike, Mike said it all. I mean, that fairgrounds competition was not, not good this winter, so I, I can't see him. Let's move straight on to number eight, hence a horse who seems to be gathering uh, what you might call a little bit of wise guy attention. I wanted to talk to you, Andy, specifically about the figure and your view of the form of the Sunland Derby and then get your thoughts on hints. Yeah, we, we initially made the figure for the Sunland Derby in 93, and it was uh, the, the day was a little ambiguous, but when uh, you know some horses started r running out of the Sunland Derby and really running well, we thought that race could be higher, and we re reviewed the whole last part of the card, and it looked like the track had, in fact, slowed down. And we, you know, it wasn't just the Sunland Derby, but you know, some other races uh, that we had underrated. So we we raised the the latter part of the card by four points, and that certainly puts hints uh, in there. Even if it didn't, I, I'd say this about uh, hints, uh, regardless of his figure. When, when, when I think of the Derby and the kinds of horses who win it, I always think of horses who make the big, powerful, wide, swooping move on the turn. I mean, you could you could name a million of them. But, uh, uh, 
uh, from secretariat to unbridled to orb and so on. Well, nobody in this group, uh, in my view, has made made a more eye-catching move in any of the prep races that than Hintz did in Sunland. Now, I would say, you know, the the you know the big wide move was perhaps abetted by the track because I thought that was a a significant dead rail at Sunland that day. Nevertheless, I mean, this horse uh, ran well. He can really finish. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the, his, his figure is, is certainly competitive. I mean, he would be in my top three. Mike, do you share the enthusiasm for Hence? No. Um, and, and, and I will say this. Um, even after Andy bumped the figure up four points to a 97, and accounting for that, the second, third, fourth, and fifth place finishers all came back and ran very well, and they all improved on their on their Sutherland Derby fig. They were adjusted, bumped up Sutherland Derby fig in their next starts, which under normal circumstances for me would be, you know, a, 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 like, a, you know, a fly to fly paper kind of thing. I'd be very attracted mm-hmm. to a horse like that. But I just can't get around the fact that the, the, the pace of the Sunland Derby was nuclear. I mean, it was ridiculously fast. It was just a golden setup for this horse. And, you know, I just don't, and I don't think he's going to get as lucky two races in a row. I mean, he's just not going to be able to loop horses in the Kentucky Derby like he looped horses in the Sunland Derby uh, with that kind of nuclear pace that he got at Sunland Park. I just don't think it's going to happen for him two races in a row. All right, Listen, we'll... it is not it is not unprecedented to see <clears throat> horse uh, unlikely horses get good just you know like in their last re- prep race for the Kentucky Derby and I know this horse was kind of a non entity you know before that race but I pretty much believe the race I mean uh, 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 you know I have been kicking myself for a decade when War Emblem won the Illinois Derby saying, oh, well, he got a huge <laughs> figure in the Illinois Derby, you know, but, you know, he's, we know he's a bum. Uh, no, I mean, I, that's the, uh, you know, I, uh, I, you know, I, uh, you know, I'm not arguing that this horse should necessarily win, but I think he's, I, I think he's a legitimate contender in this field. He definitely scares me a little bit, too. I share some of Mike's reservations, thinking of him on my tickets as more of a backup for the moment with all that in mind. Number nine, E-Rap broke his maiden in the bluegrass. I have to say, to my eye at least, not the most visually compelling Kentucky Derby prep race I've ever seen. Andy, where do you stand with E-Rap? You know, I, I can't like him. But let's say if, you know, I mean, this, you know, this is a a race with so many, with such a overall a weak field. I, I think that this, this derby, you know, could wind up being run with uh, one with a figure of a hundred. And so it really doesn't take that much of a leap for a lot of these horses, you know, to, to you know, to improve a little bit and be capable of winning. I don't like Iraq. But I wouldn't fall off my chair if, if you know, if he pulled a you know a thirty to one upset. Mike, am I being too negative about his performance in the bluegrass? Should I lighten up a little bit on your rep? No, and I would fall off my chair if he won this derby. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I just I, I thought the bluegrass was a, a race that, um, on paper, uh, at the time, the bluegrass was absolutely the strongest derby prep. Um, uh, that we had seen this year. And it was the complete 180 when they actually ran the race. It was a slow paced race. A bunch of horses never moved the muscle. The runner up practical joke, to, to my way of thinking, underscored his distance limitations by having every chance to catch a maiden in IRAP the length of the stretch and being unable to do it. Um, it I, to me, it was just not a strongly run race. For a race that, especially concerning, was a race that you thought would be the best derby prep of of, of the year, and uh, you know he he got away with a very comfortable uh, trip right on a very slow pace, and, 
And, uh, you know, I just don't think he's going to get that kind of trip again this time. I mean, unless he's all of a sudden improved 10 lengths, which I guess is not implausible, but I don't expect it. Uh, you know, IRAP is nowhere for me. I can intellectually understand the case on the number 10, Gunavera, but for some reason I'm not really – I haven't been feeling it in my heart. Uh, maybe you, Mike, can, can convince me that I'm also being too harsh about this runner who was theoretically compromised 15 lengths off that slow pace you described in Florida. Yeah, I, I, I wound up taking Gunavera second in, in this race, uh, and I think he's got a, a puncher's chance to win. Uh, I, I thought – his race uh, in the Holy Bowl. I wasn't a big Gunavera fan once once you know, the calendar flipped to 2017. I thought his Delta John, down, Downs jackpot victory was kind of dressed up. Um, and I, you know, but I, I was impressed with the way he ran in the Holy Bowl. Irish Warcry, who I'll scoop myself right now, is the horse I picked in this derby, um, completely controlled the face in the Holy Bowl. But I thought Gunavera ran very, very well to be second that day. Uh, he was closer to the pace than he's comfortable being. He checked on the rail in the far turn and still was a very willing second. I loved him in the font of youth. That might have been the last winner I picked. Um, but I loved him that day because I thought the pace setup was, was much more favorable for him. Uh, and, he, and, he, and he delivered. I mean, he, he won big time. And, you know, I just thought, the ride he was given in the Florida Derby last time was, was absurd. I mean, I know that this horse is, is best when he's allowed to drop back and make one big run. But, I mean, he was completely taken out of the race. I mean, he was so far back. He had a pace that was really very slow, and he had really no chance with the way that, with the way that race set up. Now, you could say it was disappointing that he didn't catch State of Honor for second money in that race. And I would buy that. But, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to counter that by saying it was a prep. He had a bad setup. He's run better be, better than that before. Um, and I just think he's a horse who's got a puncher's chance at a decent price to impact this Kentucky Derby. Andy, what are your thoughts on Gunavera? Yeah, I think it's more, more than a puncher's chance. I mean, I agree with Mike completely about that last race in the Florida Derby. I can't fault it fall it as an absurd uh ride you know if you looked at that race on paper uh you know it looked like there was a fair amount of speed in there the horses in the you know the difficult 10 post uh are going a mile and an eighth at gulf stream castellano you like just took him back angled to the rail but in in the process of doing so he you know he was just you know, in, you know, in a different County from the rest of the horses. And, uh, you know, as, as Mike has said, you know, the speed really held up, uh, well, I mean, the horses who were running one, two, three, four early wound up finishing fifth, second, first, and fourth. And the only closer who, uh, you know, who got into the frame, uh, you know, was, uh, Guinevere. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I think this horse is a, is a definite contender. I definitely get the case. All right, we're halfway through the main body of the field. Take a little break for another word from our sponsor. I want to tell you about the 10% Oaks and Derby Exacta winner's bonus. You can bet Exactas in the Kentucky Oaks and Kentucky Derby on Naira bets, and when you win, you'll receive a 10% winner's bonus. How does it work? Let's say your winning Derby Exacta pays 200 bucks. Well, Naira bets will add 20 bucks on top of that. Wagers need to be made via mobile device to qualify. This promotion is available exclusively to Naira Bets customers only. Visit NairaBets.com to sign up today. The 11th horse in the field is Battle of Midway, coming out of the Santa Anita Derby, a race I was not overly impressed by. But if it was just an average race, I probably would be a little more interested in a horse like Battle of Midway, cutting out fast fractions and hanging around at the end. Andy, where are you with him? I thought that San Anita Derby was very bad, and I thought the uh, the racetrack was, <clears throat> uh, uh, particularly late in the day, was quite inside speed favoring. So he, I mean, like even with you know maybe the track in his favor, he gets a figure of eighty eight. I, uh, you know that that race came up like nineteen points slower <clears throat> than the uh, Santa Anita Oaks. Uh, you know, I, uh, uh, you know, I hope, I hope, we're, I think we, there's a chance we could be seeing that Santa Anita Oaks uh, 
uh, winner of Paradise Woods, uh, you know, uh, possibly uh, in this Triple Crown series. Uh, Mike, do you have any dissenting opinion about the Santa Anita Derby in general or Battle of Midway specifically? Well, no, it, it was it was a shockingly weak race. Um, it, it, I will say that if you want anyone out of the Santa Anita Derby, it would probably be Battle of Midway, only because I don't understand the strategy involved with him. I mean, why was he out there battling for the early lead anyway? I mean, two starts back in his first attempt around two turns, he rated beautifully uh, off the pace. I mean, he settled nicely. I mean, he, he was he, he he responded when he was asked uh, on the far turn, and I just don't get the trip that he was given in, in that race. And um, you know, uh, if Andy's right about the track being speed favoring, well, that's something that I didn't consider. But I will say this: I understand the strategy involved with that. Little bit. I thought he ran the best race, buddy, out of what was. And I do agree on this point. It's been an extraordinarily weak San Anita Derby. Number 12, Sonneteer is still a maiden, but he's going to be a ginormous price. And he does, according to various late pace figure calculations, have among the best closing kick in the field. Am I nuts, Mike, to think he could maybe sneak in there for third or fourth if everything breaks his way? Well, if commanding curve can get a piece of the Kentucky Derby, anybody can. So uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't talk you off Sonneteer uh, if you want to include him underneath in your your tries and your supers. I mean, I, he's going to be much too big a price uh, for me, and, and there's no percentage of me like knocking this horse. All, all I'm going to say is he's a bait, and and you know the fact that he finished fourth, beating two lengths in the Arkansas Derby, the Classic Empire, I think is an indication of something that we'll probably discuss in a few horses down the road. Um, but uh, I, I'll hit at it. I, you know, the Arkansas Derby was not a strong race. Uh, and, um, you know, and I'll just leave it at that. Andy, your thoughts on Sonneteer? You know, I have no thoughts on Sonneteer. Uh, you know, in fact, I, 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 I until uh, until we just came to him in this broadcast, I had forgotten his existence. And I don't think I'll be reminded of it Saturday, so we can move on. He did sneak into the field very late. I could see how that might happen. Number thirteen, Jay Boys Echo has that big buyer speed figure two back. Andy, is that enough to keep him on your radar despite the flop in the blue dress? Yeah. I certainly paid attention. I mean, uh, he did have a, a, a good setup in that race. I mean, there was a, you know, I mean, a you know, a fast speed duel. I mean, he beat a he beat a pretty good field, but I mean, the, the you know, there there was there was kind of no excuse in the in the bluegrass, and you just have to think that the aberration in his. PPs was that big win in the Gotham and not anything else. I mean, I, uh, look, if he wins, I'll be boasting. He had the best fire speed <laughs> figure, but, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I, I don't see him. Watch your, your feelings on Jay boys. <laughs> well, I, I do see him and I, and I, and I picked him third in this race. And um, I, he's a horse that I, I sort of had a, a love hate relationship with. I, I, I picked him in the Weekend Warrior in the Delta Downs jackpot. He had a trip and a half in that race. I don't understand what the jock was doing with him that day. Um, so I came back and I picked him with the Withers. And his Withers was a dreadful performance. I mean, even if you allow for the fact he was coming from a November to February layoff, it was an awful performance because the runner-up in that race, Two Timber, went to his knees at the start of that race and then was rushed out of his skin uh, along the rails to avoid getting shut off so that he could be, he wouldn't get shut off. And Jake Boy's Echo couldn't catch him for a second that day. And I was just, I was so disappointed. It wasn't, it was ridiculous. And when he came back and he won the Gotham, I was spitting blood. I was at Gulfstream. That was, that was not the youth day. And I was spitting blood. I mean, that he would run that well when I finally got off of him. And, and of course I went back to him in, in the bluegrass and, he ran a, a, a well-beaten fourth. Look, he he was completely pace compromised in the bluegrass as much as he was pace set up when he won the Gotham. But I thought his Gotham was a legitimately good performance. And if 
you know, there are a lot of people out there that think McCracken has an excellent chance to win this Kentucky Derby. Well, if you like McCracken, you know, why can't you use Jay Boy's Echo, who's going to be two or three times the price of McCracken, and who had the same excuse that McCracken had, or a similar one anyway, in the bluegrass. I mean, he was pace compromised, and I think he's probably going to get a better pace set up this time around. I think he's a long shot with a chance of this race. Mike, I think you already tipped your hand a little bit talking about our morning line favorite number 14, Classic Empire. But I would love to hear your your full thoughts on this horse. Do you rank him as a contender who you don't think will be value, or are you more against him than that even? Well, I, I, I'm a Classic Empire fan. I, I thought his... I thought his Breeders' Cup juvenile win was uh, a, a very fine effort. I thought it was. I thought that was an especially strong, strongly run Breeders' Cup juvenile. And I think this horse has a world of talent, and he and he might very well be. Uh, mastery aside, mastery of course the horse that won the San Felipe and then suffered a condylar fracture, fracture and was pulled up literally seconds after that brilliant victory. Him aside, Classic Empire has probably got more talent than anybody else. But uh, his his year has been a complete mess. Uh, he, he did not run a step in the Holy Bowl. He, uh, uh, he came out of the race, he had a foot abscess, and that was playing, but his, uh, his complete no-show in the Holy Bowl. Um, that mucked up his training for a good period of time. And then when he finally got over that, he didn't want to train. Uh, for a while. I mean, he just refused to train. And then they, they whisked him off into Central Florida uh, under the eyes of nobody. And all of a sudden, he started turning in the greatest works a horse ever turned in. And he was back on the beam. And, and then he came and he won the Arkansas Derby. Now, to his credit, the Arkansas Derby was his first real race when he threw out the Holy Bull in five months. So for him to win that race, it shows this horse has a lot of substance and a lot of talent. But when you look at the race as just a race, I thought it was a weekly run race, uh, a maiden finished four feet and two lengths in it. You could make an argument that the runner-up conquest more money, ran by far the best race in the, in the Arkansas Derby because he was on the pace every step of the way and ran hard every single step of the way. And in a Kentucky Derby context, you could also say, look, Classic Empire, so I had only one real race in five months. Is that enough foundation for this horse, no matter how talented he might be, to win a mile and a quarter, the mile and a quarter Kentucky Derby? I don't think it is. I didn't pick him one, two, three, four. Andy, could he be cycling back to that big 102 buyer speed figure from the juvenile, or have we perhaps seen the best of Classic Empire at this point? Well, I don't know. I, I would, you know, I, I thought that. Uh, his juvenile was very good. I think it was the best race run by any member of this Derby field. But, you know, Wayne Lucas always used to say, you know, when asked about his bringing horses up to the Derby, you, you can't make compromises and win the Kentucky Derby. Well, Classic Empire's whole season has been compromised. Uh, you know, one thing after another has set him back. I think it was indicative at, at one at one point they were aiming at <clears throat> aiming for the uh, uh, for the bluegrass as their sort of last chance to uh, you know to get a, a prep race in, and they couldn't even get <laughs> you know uh, get him to the gate on April eighth, and so on April fifteenth he beats you know a really weak field in, in the Arkansas Derby. Um, I, d I just think you have to, uh, I, I, you know, I take, you not only take a position against this horse, I just think there are just so many negatives. Uh, I would be su surprised if he's in the top 10. Old words, but I see where you're coming from based on all the trouble he's faced. You mentioned that. Lose just, there are just too many negatives. You know, it's uh, it's not like he's sporting any great figures as, as a three-year-old. Uh, you know, just, uh, just too, too many issues with this horse. I understand. You mentioned the idea of the, the Lucas quote about having a compromised three-year-old campaign and how hard that can be. McCracken's another who missed some time. Doesn't not the same level of of soap opera drama as we saw with Classic Empire. Are you at all concerned, though, Andy, with McCracken and that time that he missed, or do you think he's one who could be pointing to show his best on Derby Day? 
you know, I've, I've never been a believer in him. I mean, I, you know, there it was some weeks ago, um, he was like the leading contender for the Kentucky Derby. And I thought, how, how can you have that status on the basis of a win in the grade three Sam Davis at Tampa Bay? Uh, I didn't get it. And in with the benefit of hindsight, look if you look at uh, McCracken, uh, Taprit, uh, State of Honor, the, the form of those horses – and the form of the Tampa Bay prep races just has not held up. So I I don't think McCracken is all that good. I mean, uh, you know, his his bluegrass was it was quite an uninspiring effort. I I'm I'm not sold on him at all. Mike, I'll ask you a very specific question about McCracken, and then of course we'll get into your general thoughts. What do you think of this morning line of five to one on McCracken? Well, what do I think about the tracks morning line in general? Uh, the tracks morning line adds up to 138.03 points, which suggests that you can have 111% of something, which is a mathematical impossibility. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I just, you know, the morning line is, is an unbalanced, invalid morning line. Um, you know, you could, you could take issue with the prices that I hung up on horses uh, in the DRF line, but uh, one thing you can take issue with is that my line does balance. And, uh, you know, I think five to one is, is too low on McCracken. Um, I'm not sure really where his constituency is. Uh, uh, you know, I think if you were a fan of McCracken before the bluegrass, you probably saw enough in the bluegrass considering the fact that a very minor foot issue, ankle issue made him miss a scheduled start in the Tampa Bay Derby. So he was coming off a layoff when he ran in the bluegrass. And he's got a trainer in Ian Wilkes who has something of a reputation of being able to uh, masterfully uh, bring horses up to performances for their uh, long-term goals. And, you know, if, if, if you were a fan of McCracken before the bluegrass, you probably still are. But if you were someone who was ambivalent about McCracken before the bluegrass, I don't see how you can be a fan now because, you know, uh, Andy mentioned about the horses who we beat in the Sam Davis. Well, what about the horses he beat before that? Wild Shot, Warriors Club, Ballandry, Death Suite. I mean, you know, you could probably make that claim about uh, many other horses in this race, but I think Mac McCracken built his, his, his credentials on the backs of very weak races. And um, I was... I thought his performance in Bluegrass was flat. He was face compromised, but he had no punch at the stretch. And uh, he's a horse that I think could, at his best could probably get a minor share of this race, but I, I'm not featuring him in any way, shape, or form. I, I understand. I'm attracted to him. I enjoyed watching him work out this week. I like the narrative about Wilkes leaving something in the tank, improving for the Derby, but the 5-1 to one gives me a little bit of pause. We'll have to see what happens in the actual betting market. I think it'll be higher, Pete. Okay. Well, that's, I think it'll be higher. That, 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 that would, that would uh, definitely lead to him being included in, in m many more things for me. Another horse who impressed some people just in his appearance on the track this week is number 16, Tappert. Seems like we've had this conversation about several in this field about the no-show in the bluegrass. Add Tappert's name to that list. Did you see any excuse for him, Mike? And uh, do you see him appearing on your tickets at all? Well, like several other horses in the bluegrass, he was face compromised. But unlike, you know, unlike McCrack and, and Jay Boy Zecco, who at least, you know, lifted their hoofs a couple of times during the running of the bluegrass, Caprick never moved a muscle. I mean, he was dismal in that race. And, um, you know, it's one of the reasons why Andy says the Tampa – Tampa Bay form hasn't held up. I mean, he won the Tampa Bay Derby in McCracken's absence, but he beat State of Honor, who we've already discussed. The horse who's seriously distance challenged. And third in that race was Wild Shot, another horse who's distance challenged and is properly cutting back to a mile in the pack day, stakes on the undercard on, on Derby Day. And then, you know, before that, I thought McCracken ate him for lunch when he was second in the Sam Davis. And, and before that, he was slow. I mean, you know, I, 
uh, Tappert is a horse that I've taken a position against all year long, and I see no reason to alter my view. No reason to get on the bandwagon now, I suppose. Andy, your thoughts on Tappert? Yeah, well, I always pay attention when Mike Welsh says a horse is training well, and he's evidently been training well. But again, I can't, I can't get around, uh, you know, my feelings about the uh, uh, the Tampa Bay form. And and here we've got another Pletcher horse who runs great in Florida, and uh, you know, and now is on, you know, is you know, is, you know, is on the downgrade. So uh, uh, I'm I'm not a Taprit fan. Mike already tipped his hand about number 17, Irish War Cry. Andy, I'm imagining you're attracted at the least to those two triple-digit buyer speed figures in, uh, in the last three races. But, of course, then there's that one in the middle to contend with. Where do you end up on Irish War Cry? I, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm on the bandwagon. I mean, Mike, <laughs> Mike and I will probably be crushed by <laughs> underneath <laughs> it uh, to, together. But, I mean, the sources run – Two uh, buyer speed figures of a hundred one. I mean, he beat, uh, you know, he beat solid. You know, I mean, he beat horses with, you know, kind of good reputations in the, you know, in the both the Wood and the Holy Bull. Uh, you know, we've talked about Guinevere as a, you know, as a legitimate contender here, and you know, he, he you know, he trounced him there. Uh, you know, I. Uh, you know, I have great respect for Gray Emotion as a trainer. I mean, I really do like to see a, a horse in the hands of somebody who's won the Kentucky Derby. You know that uh, uh, you know this is such a specialized uh, challenge for a trainer that when somebody has you know has you know has gone through the grind and you know and you know and, and come out a winner. I mean that that's a little upgrade for me. Uh, so I mean you know if he didn't have that clunker in the fountain of youth, which is in you know nobody can understand, this horse would be ever it would be the clear cut favorite. Uh, but I, I think you know he the way he came back in the Wood Memorial, he you know I think he showed that that was probably an aberration. I I I think by a a, a, a narrow margin he's he's the horse to beat i'll play devil's advocate here this is a horse i like as well but i've had some uh, sharp people point out to me the one race he was in that had the fast pace the fountain of youth uh he, he wanted no part of it uh, what i'm thinking is why does he have to be that close if they go fast why can't he be in the top quarter of the field and sort of do his stalk and pounce thing from there mike where do you think uh, what kind of trip is this horse going to get well, if people are, if some people are telling you that the only fast-paced race he, he was in was the Found of Youth, then those people are giving you bad information <laughs> because I thought the pace of the Wood Memorial was completely solid. I mean, it, it was very much the equal of what the Excelsior pace was two races before, and that looked like a very solid pace too. Um, you know, about Irish War Cry in general. Number one. He's got the two triple-digit buyer speed figures, and here's a little here's a little um, um, nugget for you. Uh, of the 20 horses in the main body of this Kentucky Derby, they have a total of 129 total career starts. There are only four triple-digit buyer speed figures in this field, and Irish War Cry owns two of them. So that right there tells you that he might, on his day, simply be faster than these horses. That's number one. Um, number two. I like this Holy Bowl, but not a lot because he controlled a very moderate pace that day. Uh, I like his Wood Memorial much, much more because he relaxed around the first turn of a pace that was, I'm saying, completely solid. And then he went up and, and into entering the back stretch. Then he went up and pressed that pace and how did the Italian runner. And he did this while, while running on a day at Aqueduct where if you were on the lead, you pretty much won. I mean, there was a significant speed bias April 8th at Aqueduct on the main track. And Irish War Cry really pretty much ran against that bias, especially in the early initial stages of the Wood Memorial. And he still went on and dominated the race. Uh, you know, I, I just think you know, he, he's the right horse. He's got the right kind of running style. Um, and I'm hoping everybody avoids him because post-17 is zero for 38. Um, and, you know, <laughs> I, I'm perfectly happy with post 17, especially since post 16 is four for 45 and post 15 is five for 55. So, you know, I mean, you know, I, I really, I just, 
think Irish War Cry is the horse for this race. There's no magic to that post-17 stat, I can tell you that. I think the disagreement about the, the pace there also has to do with some people are mi- – I agree with you, Mike, and I think some people are missing how that race really kind of quickened up between the half and six furlongs, and he was right there and then draws off. There's a lot to like about this horse. I do hope he can get the get a favorable trip, not be too wide, hope the track is fair to horses who have to maybe be a little wide in the turns. But Churchill often plays that way. going to be very interesting to see what happens in the betting with Irish War Cry. Number 18 is Gormley, another coming out of the Santa Anita Derby that none of us seem too impressed with. Um, where, what are you doing with him, Mike? Uh, well, Gormley fooled me and a whole bunch of other people when he won the sham in his first start this year because everybody thought, and I did too, uh, that that was a strongly run race. But that proved to be the fluke for this horse. I mean, uh, because when you go back and look at his win in the front runner last year, it was when he controlled a very easy early pace. And I know I say that all the time, but how these horses win is so important. Um, and then he, you know, he kind of clunked along and won a very slow San Anita Derby in his most recent start. I, I, I just think when uh, a race is run, honestly, Gormley's in deep trouble. Any case to conjure for Gormley, Andy? Well, the only thing, you know, I'm uh, equally negative about the San Anita Derby form. He did the, run the best race of his life on a sloppy track, and uh, that 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 could be a handicapping factor on Saturday. Fair point. Number 19, Practical Joke, um, always seems to be in the hunt. And when I watch this race, when I try to play what this race is going to look like in my mind, I see him in the hunt as they're turning for home. I'm not sure I see him seeing it out from there. Andy, where are you with Practical Joke? You know, I don't like him. You know, if, if we didn't have speed figures in the in the racing form, you would look at this, at his form. With, you know, I mean, he's never run a bad race. He's got two grade ones and so on. Uh, but he, he's never run a, a, a notable figure and he's, you know, he, he's never really, you know, finished with a kick, a kick that suggests he wants to go a mile and a quarter. I mean, his, his, his main claim to fame is win in the champagne. He got up by a nose, uh, to win after like an absolutely suicidal speed duel had, you know, take it a toll on Syndergaard. Uh, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, you know, I, I just don't want him. Uh, I think Chad Brown is going to have to, you know, wait uh, for his breakthrough in the Triple Crown. Watch your thoughts on Practical Joke. Uh, I think he's distance challenged. Um, I think he's a nice colt, and I think, um, I think you know, one turn races at this particular point in his career are are really where. Uh, he would do best, um, and, but you know he uh, he stretched out to two turns with a Breeders' Cup Juvenile, and he made a nice run around the far turn, but failed to sustain it. Uh, he made a, a bit of a run on the fountain in the youth, but failed to sustain it. He had the whole length of the stretch to catch a maiden in the bluegrass and couldn't do it. I mean, these are all indications of a horse that just right now, at this particular point in his career, uh, it is not a, a distance horse. Number 20, Patch, has had a lot of articles written about him already this Kentucky Derby week, hailing from storied Calumet Farm, the the, the one eye. Um, does he have a chance for a storybook ending on Saturday, Watch? Well, you know, I, I think it's his left eye. He's, he's missing his left eye, if I'm not mistaken, right? And and if that's the case, then he doesn't know he's winning against 19 other horses. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, look, I, joke, jokes aside, um, Patch would have to improve uh, many, many lengths in order to impact this field. So, I mean, he's a nice horse who's got his best races ahead of him. I, I really do think that this is too much too soon for this horse. Andy, your plus, plus don't don't forget the uh, uh, the curse of Apollo uh, applies to him too. <laughs> uh, no, no races as, as a two year old. Um, do, do I'll just ask it this way: Do we need to spend any time on either of the two also eligibles, Andy? Starting with you, no. Watch anything on either of these guys? Well, yeah, I think it's important to note that you know we uh, we really don't hope it doesn't happen. We hope nothing 
uh, uh, Stad calls uh, the horses in the party of the race. But if Royal Mo draws into this race, uh, it, it very much uh, affects the, the the pace complexion of this race because he's going to be a significant base presence in this race, and uh, he will uh, somewhat ensure, especially since he'll be breaking from the outside post and will have to send, he will ensure a pace that will be probably more than honest and be downright fast. And I think that that's something that people have to keep in mind, uh, you know, but that said, we hope that nothing befalls the horse, the 20 that are in the body of the race. Something to keep an eye on though, for sure. Going to do another quick word from the sponsor here. And then I'm going to ask you guys about what your current thoughts are on how to bet this race. But first I want to talk about the one, two, three, four million point hit and split Earn more at Churchill Downs Derby Week with the Naira Bets. One, two, three, four million point giveaway starting Thursday. Hit the Churchill Late Pick 4 to split one million points. A little late for that, I guess. On Friday, Late Pick 4 winners split two million points. And on Derby Day, All Stakes Pick 4 winners split three million points. If you hit the Churchill Pick 4 on all three days, Naira Bets members will split four million points. Find details on this and all Derby Week wagering promotions at NairaBets.com. Naira Betts, racing's best play. All right, let's get down to, we're talking about betting. Let's get down to how we're thinking of betting this race. Watch, we'll start with you. Are you more interested at this point, at this race, from a vertical perspective, for, for the uninitiated, talking about exactus, trifectas, superfectas, or are you more interested in it from a horizontal perspective, doubles, pick threes, pick fours, etc.? Uh, well, I'm, I'm a I'm a horizontal multi-race exotic player. That's that's really my comfort zone. But uh, this is a race, um, given the opinion that I have in it, that demands vertical wagers because uh, I'm against Classic Empire. Uh, I, I think it's uh, perfectly plausible that that uh, Always Dreaming doesn't hit the board. Um, and I I have a couple of horses underneath Irish Warcry who I really like. Uh, in Gunavera and, and J Boys Echo, uh, who are price horses who could definitely hit the board and also maybe hit the board with something cuckoo, like a commanding curve type of horse. So, uh, you know, uh, for, for somebody like me who's much more comfortable betting pick fours and pick fives, uh, I'm definitely going to bet at least tries in this race, uh, only because uh, I think you can get something explosive. Uh, in these vertical wagers in this in this spot, Andy, how about you? What's your main interest betting wise, vertical or horizontal? Well, <clears throat> well I think that if uh, I mean this is a really tough race, and I don't have any tremendous convictions, but you know a, there is a good chance that the t- the, the two betting choices are going to be horses that I'm really pretty negative on, and so that kind of uh, you know it, it inspires me to you know to make a uh, 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 you know, an exact or a try play. I mean, I'm going to box the eight, ten, and seventeen. Hence, Guinevere and Irish War Cry. You know, I prefer Irish War Cry, but I just can't see making a win bet at a on a six to one shot in a race that's basically this inscrutable. Uh, you know, I you know I want to get, you know, I, I want to get a, a real, uh, you know the you know, the reward of an exotic, you know, if I cash the ticket. So though, 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 those are my three. Great. He wants to get paid. Yeah, that's right. He wants to get paid. Yeah. uh, It makes sense. A great comment here that I need to share. And maybe, maybe you'll take the bait on this, Andy. Uh, Listener Nathan says he won't be happy unless he hears you declare one horse in this race who has no shot. If you had to pick (laughs) one no shot horse, who would it be? Oh well, there are there are too many. Uh, 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 well, obviously, you know the fast and accurate. I guess is it would be everybody's first throw out. But uh, you know, just a, as a uh, you know as a uh, you know as a a, a betting uh, uh, you know anchor for for the play. I mean that uh, to say that you know to to go against the favorite. Uh, that you know, that's uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to say he can't win, but uh, um, uh, you know, I, you know, Classic Empire will not darken any of my tickets. <laughs> 
Mike, um, you talked about your inclination to play multis. How deep would you have to go in this race in your multis to feel confident about it? Oh, um, well, it depends. Um, uh, on my on my A ticket, my my A's would probably be only two or three. Um, my backups might go a little bit deeper than that, you know. So, uh, I mean. If you kind of my A's and my C's, uh, you might get five or six horses. Gotcha. Five, five or six deep. All right. That sounds good. Question for Andy. This one is about takeout. Do you ever consider the takeout before choosing which pools to participate in? Um, not in something like the Derby. I uh, Let's say I can, you know, in, you know I mean, in, in some situation, overall, uh, uh, you know, I I don't play um, jackpot carryover bets uh, because the the effective takeout is uh, uh, you know is so onerous, and uh, uh, you know, and I think that that, that it's one of the, the, the proliferation of bets like the rainbow six because of that takeout factor, you know, have really been a negative on the game. I also decided not to spend a lot of time using my speed figures, uh, in Argentina, even though they were very good down there, because, uh, because, because the 29% takeout just did not justify all that work. So I, uh, I, you know, I, I, I pay attention to it in right in the right spots, but not to say, well, I, one bet is seventeen percent, one is a nineteen percent in the Derby. I mean, no. Mike, we got a question about dosage topic that was uh, seemed to come up every <laughs> Derby for many years. Is it? Is it something? This has to be. This has to be a listener over the age of seventy. I think. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I cannot believe that a wooden stake has been driven through the heart of most <laughs> by this point. I really can't believe it. It's fun with numbers. That's it. So not not something anybody should be uh, should be taking a look at. Uh, we got no. Andy touched on this before, but uh, I wouldn't mind your your thought on it. Are you are we at a point? A listener wants to know where being trained by Asmussen or Todd Pletcher it needs to be considered a negative in the Kentucky Derby watch. Oh boy, yeah, it's not for me. I know that Andy intimated that that would be the case for Pletcher. I mean, Pletcher wins too many races, and he's too good of a trainer to think that you know he just uh, for some reason can't win the feature race at Churchill Downs on the first Saturday of May. I mean, it's just, you know, I, I'm not saying that he hasn't, I'm not saying he's had bad luck. I'm not saying that his, his sport derby record is all entirely circumstantial. I, I think much of it has to do with the fact that he trains for so many people that, that really demand uh, their horses being in the Kentucky Derby, as opposed to a trainer that would uh, actually run a horse in the Derby who belongs. So, I think that has something to do with it. Uh, no, I'm not at the point uh, where I would consider it uh, an outright negative um, before even considering what the horse is. No. All right, that is. I, 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 I would add that. Please. I, I don't. Uh, I don't have. Uh, you know. I. I don't have any prejudice against Asmussen. I mean, he he he, sh he winds up in the Derby because he's you know he's got. You know, a lot of horses and you know, horses who are kind of marginal contenders. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's not like Pletcher. I mean, Pletcher has an army of horses every year who are all pointing for the Kentucky Derby. And his, you know, and uh, and you just can't ignore the, the fact that so many of them uh, just don't get there and, or, or just fail badly. We are out of time, gentlemen. I want to thank Andy Beyer. I want to thank Mike Watchmaker. I want to thank our sponsor for the webinars this week, Naira Bets. Go to their website, nairabets.com. Here are all about the $200 sign-up bonus, the 10% Oaks and Derby exacta winner's bonus, and the one, two, three, four million point hit and split. And get all the information there at nairabets.com. 
Thanks so much for joining us. If you want to catch the replay of the show or the show I was uh, happy to do last night with Jay Privman and Craig Milkowski of Timeform US, you can go to drf.com slash YouTube and check out all the action there. I'm Peter Thomas Fornital. Hope everybody has a great Oaks and Derby day. You've been watching a handicapping session produced by drf.com.